So, um, Guillaume, you have 20, 25 minutes to make, give your presentation. That's great. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about my thesis today. It's on curly quantum fields, measurements, and quantum energy cultivation. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, so the relation between information and energy has been of central interest to many subfields of physics for many years. And the usual contexts of study are thermodynamics, Maxwell-Lehman, black holes, area laws, entropies, cosmology, some people are working on entropic gravity, there's holography, theories of emergent space-time, ADS-CFT, um, and today we're rather gonna be focusing on relativistic quantum information. In relativistic quantum information, uh, one of the main tools is uh, probes. And we probe the quantum field with a first quantized system, say a qubit or a harmonic oscillator, and that provides a window onto the quantum field's Hilbert space. And it narrows our focus onto a subsystem of the field because the Hilbert space of the field is so large, it's kind of unwieldy. unwieldy. So by focusing on certain subspaces that we uh, couple to with probes, then we could do you know, certain, we're more flexible in our analysis of the information theoretic structure of uh, the, the fields. Um, so one caveat is uh, the information that you get uh, from the field depends highly on uh, the type of probe you use and how you couple. So today we're gonna try to uh, have an up, create unobtrusive views uh, using qubits, uh, qubits, oscillators, uh, so that we have uh, a clear window onto the Hilbert space of the quantum field, and we could do mo uh, more powerful things than uh, is usual in RQI. So an overview of what we're gonna cover today, there's a lot of content, uh, just follow my voice if you get lost. Uh, okay, so we're gonna start with different types of probes. Uh, we're gonna see there's, uh, you could do analog, quantum analog, quantum digital, using qubits, qubits, harmonic oscillators, and then uh, there's a question of which uh, is exactly the subspace of the field we are probing when we couple by some local smearing uh, to the field. And we're going to build uh, the Hilbert space, the quantum field, out of a bunch of smeared observables. And then we're going to express the Hamiltonian in terms of these observables, and that's going to be very useful for many calculations. And then we're going to apply uh, these tools and see uh, what we could use them for, such as uh, measuring uh, the state on certain subspaces of the field, entanglement harvesting, and quantum energy cultivation, last but not least. Okay, so canonically in RQI, the typical interaction we use is between a qubit and the field. It's point-like in space and spread out in time, um, but there's a certain time dependency in our, in our coupling. And um, because we're temporarily smearing the interaction, we, have, uh, we need to uh, perform a time-ordered uh, exponential and basically we have to do a perturbative expansion. And essentially, this, you know, this is a picture of the coupling. It processes in time, so the imprint it gathers from the field is kind of you know, smudged. Uh, so that's not ideal. And we're going to do theoretical simplifications that are you know, somewhat physically uh, less accurate, but uh, theoretically, they're more practical. Um, so we're going to use spatially smeared interactions temporarily uh, instantaneous. And that kills off our time ordering and we could do fully per non perturbative interactions and unitaries, and we're gonna do some powerful stuff with that. Okay, so we effectively couple to single quantum harmonic oscillator sub, uh, sub system of the field, and it's uh, this certain quadrature. This is a smeared out um, field operator smeared with respect to certain distribution. Uh, we're gonna assume they're of compact support very often. Um, so we could choose what to probe this subspace with. Uh, either a qubit, uh, n qubits, which form a qubit, which is like an, uh, an exponentially large atom, or harmonic oscillators, which is my personal favorite in this thesis. Um, so we're gonna explore the differences uh, between using these different probes, uh, first in the context of a measurement protocol, and we're gonna build some, uh, some jargon that we're gonna use later. Okay, so uh, for a continuous variable measurement, what I wanna do, let's say I wanna measure a uh, uh, harmonic oscillator A using a control system C. I could start my control system in a very narrow, sharp squeeze state, and then I could do a controlled displacement depending on the value uh, of, of the quadrature of A, I displace by a, a scalar multiple of that amount my uh, control register. 
And essentially, because we're a very sharp pointer variable, uh, the, if I were to project the control register, I get a near projective POVM, if you know, if you know what that means. Um, and very often, we're going to actually skip the projective measurements and just keep everything coherent because it's, uh, it's easier with the formalism and it's equivalent. Um, OK, so every time I use, so sorry, this is an adder gate. And we're going to, you know, you add the uh, field, you displace one by uh, depending on the uh, value of the other's quadrature. So we're going to use this very often. So the, uh, the analog to digital kind of conversion uh, the similar kind of gate is the following. And this is a very classic algorithm in quantum computing. It's called a phase estimation al algorithm. So basically, we want an adder, but now our control system is made of a bunch of qubits. So uh, we want our, read our readouts to be a binary kind of readout. And basically, the trick is uh, we start with spin ups, and then we create, we do a Fourier transform, which, uh, if we consider the virtual qubit that these guys form, uh, is a this state after the Fourier transform is a uniform superposition. And let's say we expand our target state in eigenstates of the observable we're trying to measure. Then if you act a certain exponential of an operator onto an eigenstate, it becomes a phase. And the phase, as we all know, kicks through tensor products. So we call this a kickback. And so because these are controlled unitaries, they depend on the state of, of which uh, superposition in here. Um, then each different superposition will pick up a different phase. And then when we inverse Fourier transform, these relative phases get converted into actually uh, the standard base of zeros and ones. So essentially, um, this is like a shift operator, but it shifts the binary value and gives us an approximate value, binary readout. And you could use a lot, of, a lot more qubits, and it, it, uh, it converges to a near projective measurement, like the uh, squeeze state and the limit of very large squeeze. And what's really neat is that we actually use single qubit to oscillator uh, interactions and pre and post processing to form a qubit. Um, and these are kind of like unregulated, they're like sigma z uh, coupled to um, the field. So, so very often we're gonna, I'm going to use the harmonic oscillator version because it's the simplest and the cleanest. But uh, keep in mind that it's, we could always uh, emulate uh, the harmonic oscillator with a bunch of qubits qubits this way with the heart of the Fourier transform. OK, so we coupled a bunch of probes to we start with this smeared observable. So what subspace of the, of the field are we coupling to? Usually we factorize the Hilbert space, uh, factorize, but yeah, uh, using a maximal uh, commuting set of observables to field at every point, for example. That's a, you know, very, a typical cartoon we use, is a bunch of coupled harmonic oscillators being a quantum field. Um, and we have a com canonical commutation relation with a five <coughs> IF point. And out of these operators, we construct you know, every uh, other observable. Um, OK, so now we would like to, instead of write it in a spatial decomposition, write it in terms of smeared observables. So for each phi, we could build a pi, which is just a smeared pi with a normalization. Uh, and they obey the canonical commut commutation relation. And suppose we have a, an orthogonal basis for uh, the L squared integral functions, um, then we could build out of this basis a maximally commuting set of observables. Uh, and we get a harmonic oscillator for every basis element. And the Hilbert space factorizes into the Hilbert space of the subspace <coughs> of each smearing. Uh, and often, we're going to just have a bunch of disjoint, compactly supported uh, smearings. And then we're going to assume there exists a basis completion in some sense. Uh, but we don't need to work with these directly. Just kind of abstract formalism, but it's very practical and shortens calculation like tenfold. Um, okay, so what's useful about this is that we could rewrite the Hamiltonian. Usually we, we write the Hamiltonian like this. We have a derivative coupling. If you expand the derivative as a, a finite difference approximation, then you get a nearest neighbor like quadratic coupling. Uh, usually we decouple, we go to we diagonalize the Hamiltonian, uh, we, we take Fourier transform, right? And uh, so the Fourier transform is like the, the kind of the eigenbasis of, of the, of, it's like the meta eigenbasis of, of the uh, Hamiltonian. So in terms of smeared observables, it's not diagonal, it's more like the space, but uh, we, we have something like this, and we have a quadratic coupling here. And if we assume that uh, the, our basis is made of compactly supported functions, then the derivatives are also compactly supported. And uh, you know these guys only couple to a handful of other guys, maybe uncountable, but whatever. Um, 
And so it's like a, a virtual lattice, just like this is a lattice of harmonic oscillators. So we could use this to uh, uh, port over some calculations from actual lattice calculations later on. Okay, so um, a quick review of Gaussian states, lightning review. Uh, so ground states of quadratic Hamiltonians are Gaussians. Gaussian states are fully specified by where they are and how they're squished. Um, and the phase space grows linearly in the number of oscillators. Uh, so it's, it's really nice. You could do nice uh, detailed calculations of energy and uh, entropies and whatnot. That's what we use. And any quadratically generated unitary, like the one we use for the aggregates, preserves Gaussianity. So we're going to be working the Gaussian state formalism, and it's a powerful formalism that allows for our cal calculations to be very attractive. OK, so the ground state of, of this quadratically coupled uh, Hamiltonian is Gaussian in terms of the smeared observables. So that's very practical. So more or less the central theme, the theme of the thesis is um, the, what I call the local versus non-local duality. So the ground state uh, is in unentangled in the Fourier factorization, right? The, the Hamiltonian is, is diagonal, so it's, like a, it's a product state of ground states. But when you have couplings, you have entanglement across tensor factors. And that's what we use for entanglement harvesting, the entanglement between the different smears. And conversely, if I do a local operation when I, that's compactly supported, when I take a Fourier transform, it's non-local in Fourier space. So something that's local uh, in space is non-local in kind of the meta-eigen basis of energy. So energetically, uh, a local action is, is non-local. That's kind of what we use for quantum energy teleportation. Uh, we use both these, this formalism and um, Fourier uh, modes for the calculations of the thesis. Okay, so entanglement harvesting. That's our first application of probing. We've uh, done all our background now. So the goal of entanglement harvesting is you want to swap entanglement that's living uh, between these subspaces of the field onto a certain probe. I choose harmonic oscillators because they're the most compatible in some sense and easy to work with. And uh, you do a continuous, we, I do a continuous variable swap gate because it exists. Um, and basically, if you know quantum computing, this is extremely familiar. Uh, this is how you build swap gates with usual qubits, qubit adders, but in this case, it's harmonic oscillator adders. And essentially, we swap the state locally here and here, and whatever entanglement we have between uh, these two subspaces uh, gets transferred onto the probes. And you harvest all the entanglement that was in, in between these two subspaces for the ground state or whatever state you really want. Uh, so Gaussian interactions are easily computable, fitted the thesis, and again, you could uh, swap it using uh, you, sw you could swap it onto a digital register if you wanted, uh, and using unregulated interactions. Okay, so quantum energy teleportation, uh, different application. Uh, so this is the basic protocol. Usually we use a single uh, qubit, and we couple to a certain subspace. And basically we want to harness the correlations between uh, these two subspaces, such that once we measure here, we gain some level of knowledge about the fluctuations over here, uh, because we don't know much about it here, it costs energy. When we couple, we create fluctuations, we inject energy. And then when we transfer over the information to Bob, uh, because we have some knowledge of B, we can suppress these fluctuations. And how, what kind of gate do we do? It's just an adder gate, but we tune the coupling in the right way. And uh, basically here I do a fully coherent protocol, and there's a theorem that says you could do this, you could skip. Instead of measuring after measuring the qubit after Alice does her interaction and sending classical information, you could just send quantum information, and it's theoretically uh, the same protocol. So, for math, math, just for formalism, it's easier to stay coherent. Okay, so this is this uh, this is the calculation I did. It's the same protocol, but uh, you know on steroids in some sense. Um, I, you have multiple sites where you measure and multiple target sites, and you use uh, harmonic oscillators. And we want to use the correlations between every uh, you know, pair of sites between A and B. And uh, we want to do this in a smart way. So uh, again, we use uh, adder gates to do a, a measurement using squeeze states, as we saw. And then we carry over the information, and then we couple each to each. And then we suppress the fluctuations. So it's one to one here and all to all there, but you could split up the interactions. And here's a circuit representation using our adder gates we mentioned. And you have a coupling, you have to tune for each it's a coupling matrix. And in the calculations, I, I found the optimum for energy teleportation. What you want is uh, to create 
negative energy density at the target site, which means you, you had lowered the energy from the vacuum energy density. Okay, so we could calculate this using uh, our formalism. Uh, this is one of the cleaner answers I was able to copy from the thesis. Uh, in the limit of very large squeezing, we get the optimal energy, well this is a change in energy, so it's negative, is a correlator, the case with the distance, uh, divided by some variance and some norm. Uh, and basically the, the self-variance of, this is basically Alice, um, it, that's considered as noise. It's like fluctuations that are not from correlation with uh, Bob. Okay, so for numerics, we could port over all our formalism to actually use uh, an actual finite discrete lattice and run it on a computer. And we could, well, it's not showing very well, but we could uh, compute entanglement entropies and we have more freedom that way because we have power of Gaussian state formalism and, and numerics. So uh, here are some plots, there are many more, but uh, the, the most basic thing we're uh, to expect is that uh, this is, you, want, you want this to be negative for more energy extraction, but you extract more energy as the mutual information increases. Something more surprising is on the right is that you actually, when you extract energy at site B, you increase the entanglement entropy of B with its complement. And that's interesting because the me a good measurement actually breaks entanglement, right? If a certain subset is entangled with a bunch of other things and you perturb it with a probe, then you break the entanglement it had. And you inject energy by doing so. But when you extract energy, you actually increase the entanglement. So there seems to be a nice little relation there. And uh, there may be some Im deeper implications. Uh, maybe I'll talk about that later. Okay, so other calculations. This is just the laundry list. Um, uh, measurements, so yeah, so for the multipoint measurement, computed energetic cost information, gain, broken entanglement, qubits, qubits, bits, harmonic oscillators. Uh, for general multipoint measurement, did some entanglement harvesting, calculated the uh, energetic cost of swap gates using formalism, it was a clean calculation. Then for quantum energy to rotation, I did information gain versus entanglement breaking for the uh, measurements, and all the energetics for the multipoint, uh, multipoint continuous variable case, which we saw, the finite uh, discrete harmonic lattice, which uh, was in collaboration with Jason, but I forgot to mention, uh, the numerics. Um, and uh, for clock-like qubits, which I didn't mention, but it was a paper with Eddie and Akeem, um, but uh, I don't have time to talk much about that. Uh, yeah, and numerical analysis. Okay, so uh, this is the bonus round. Uh, this is uh, some of the cool stuff that I, I've come up with towards the end of my thesis, but I hadn't I had time to finish. So. The best measurement for quantum energy teleportation is about breaking entanglement. So I, want, I wonder how could we break all the entanglement of a certain region with its exterior? Well, in general, if I project, if I have a certain entangled pure state, I have a Schmidt decomposition, and say I, I measured A in the Schmidt basis, then I go from an entangled state and a product here to a GHZ type uh, entanglement, and that breaks the uh, uh, the uh, entanglement between A and its complement completely. Well, it, it breaks a big chunk. Uh, okay. So now let's say we have a spherical region and its causal diamond. Uh, and there must exist a Schmidt decomposition for the bipartition between uh, the Hilbert space of this and its complement. And the Schmidt basis is necessarily the eigenbasis of the modular Hamiltonian. If you have something like this, you take a trace, you know, it's going to be. Sum like this. The modular Hamiltonian is like the log of, of the reduced density matrix. So when you do a singular value decomposition theorem for your Schmidt decomposition, it's kind of like optimizing <coughs> the local Bogoliubov -Bog transformations. And for in quantum field theory, Bogoliubov -Bog transformations are like changing coordinates and they're a change of basis of modes, right? So I was wondering, can you construct a set of Schmidt basis modes, right? Because when you have a basis for a quantum field, it's a bunch of modes. So working backwards from some recent work by Jacobson, um, constructed some modes, uh, and this, this is an example. So usually in the, in the Rindler case, when we have one horizon, we have a chirp near the horizon and then a, a, a red shifts. But since here we have kind of two horizons, I have a double chirp, that's interesting. Uh, I have actually some geometric intuition using path integrals and stuff. Maybe somebody can ask me about that later. Uh, I have an extra slide. Uh, so the next steps, are to compute Bogoliubov transformation, uh, Bogoliubov coefficients, and then compute energetics. Like when I break all the entanglement, how much energy did I inject? And could I use this for some ultimate QET protocol? And what's interesting is that it, 
What's interesting with these modes is that basically when you, you optimize over local unitaries, when you find the Schmidt basis, you kind of filter out the self-correlations with an A and with an A bar. You only keep the correlations that cross A and A bar. So when we were sampling a bunch of points, you know, if I sample a bunch of points in, in, in this region, if they're, they're neighboring, then they're highly correlated. So my information would be highly redundant. But in this way, if I sample this way, uh, these are, it, it's kind of diagonal. It's, diagonal, it's like the, uh, the Rindler decomposition of the state in terms of Rindler modes. Uh, so I get completely un uncorrelated information. So it's like, instead of having the pros process the information in QET, we did some, uh, you know, optimize over couplings to undo some self-correlations with an A. This just gives you the, the perfect raw information. Um, okay, so in conclusion, some key messages. Uh, you can collect quantum information, or classical, about a certain observable, uh, about subspaces of, of the field by uh, some probes. Um, and you can record this information on quantum digital, or quantum analog, and the digital and analog kind of in a certain limit, they're equivalent. Um, you could collect uh, quantum information at multiple locations, and the uh, entanglement of the field gets swapped onto the uh, probes. Uh, you could perform an optimal quantum energy teleportation protocol that harnesses multi-point correlations. And in terms of our main theme of energy versus information, we thought something interesting. Measurements seem to cost energy, measurement of a vacuum uh, seem to cost energy and break vacuum entanglement. And when we extract energy from the local volume, a vacuum, it reinforces the va vacuum entanglement. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much.